Our goal with this panel, of course, is really to have as much interactive discussion as we can. So again, I'd ask the panelists to please uh, be behaved when it comes to timing as best as possible. Uh, six to seven minutes was the request for the presentations. And as we're taking our seats, uh, I've also been asked to give you an announcement regarding the documentation. Uh, as you've noticed, we are documenting everything, uh, unless there's a speaker who doesn't want that, uh, with video. Uh, we will be publishing that on the ICD webpage and also making it available through the social media. Uh, so in that sense, you don't have to worry so much about taking notes uh, of everything that is said. Everything will be documented. Uh, my colleague Esteban is helping us with that. He is also taking photos, uh, which we will put also on the webpage and again, Twitter, Facebook. So we're trying to spread the word, spread the messages from this event as well widely as possible. We just had a very good discussion also over the coffee break about the possibility of putting together a book uh, or a publication. Uh, Ogmundur, I've had this in the back of our mind uh, for a while already, and I think it's a very good idea. So this is an invitation to, in particular, all of the speakers. If you would like to contribute something uh, in a written form, that would be most welcome. Uh, and we can consider how we could put this together in a volume, uh, perhaps published from a publisher here in uh, Iceland, unless there are other suggestions in the room. And uh, this is also something that we can publish on the web page as well. Uh, usually we have a page for each of the speakers with photos, video footage, and that's also a good place to put a paper uh, in case the paper was also presented. So just a few notes uh, for, for the speakers and for anyone who would like to contribute. Uh, I still do see empty seats here. So again, anyone in the back, if you would like to come to the front, uh, the last shall be first, as they say. Uh, please don't be shy. And uh, really, I think that also will make it even easier afterwards for the discussion and the debate. So we don't want to force anyone, but you're most welcome to join us here. So I think everyone has now taken their seats. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is an honor and a pleasure uh, for me to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Donfried, director and founder of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, based in Berlin, Germany. Uh, and I'm also very honored and proud to have Ogmundur Jonasson uh, as a senior member of our secretariat and board. Uh, and um, one of the most active members, I think, of the ICD is, is an easy thing to say. We've collaborated in many countries of the world. Uh, this topic of international uh, human rights and cultural diplomacy has been one of the closest to our hearts. Uh, and just two sentences, two sentences about the importance of the theme for the ICD. Traditionally, cultural diplomacy was about winning the hearts and minds of foreign audiences. It was about persuading. It was about attracting. Uh, and at that time, especially in the 20th century, the logic was, don't talk about human rights. Don't talk about religion. Uh, then we'll start arguing. We'll start fighting. Talk about jazz. Talk about design. Talk about the arts, the, the nice things, the, the, the lovely things. And on the one hand, that may have worked when there was a Cold War, and it really was this, this attraction uh, force uh, on both sides. Soft power had a very special uh, role uh, during such a conflict. Today, however, we are of the clear opinion at the Institute what we need is trust. What we need is understanding. We've got to get to work. We have serious problems, whether it's migration, climate change, uh, extremism. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. We don't have time to waste on just persuading or attracting or, you know, these niceties. Uh, of course, I don't want to criticize that, and I think it's good. We all enjoy a good intercultural uh, conference uh, or, or a cultural exchange or a cultural performance. But really of essence uh, and really of urgence, uh, urgency right now is this issue of trust. Uh, and that's where we think it's essential that we bring uh, human rights into the equation, uh, not only in the format of conferences such as this. Uh, we've also, together with Judge Sabutinda, had an excellent conference in The Hague uh, where we brought together a very prominent group of, in particular, uh, legal experts from around the world. Uh, we're hoping also in the form of publications and also in the form of uh, programs that we can also see this really being implemented. Uh, one of the things on the agenda of the Institute is to try to create an academic uh, program uh, also dealing with the issues of international law, human rights, and cultural diplomacy. So we have many expectations, not only from this panel, uh, but from this conference. And we look forward so much to benefiting from the great uh, collection of wisdom and experience that we've gathered in this room. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic for this panel is democratic accountability, transnational rights, and international obligations. What is the role of trade unions and NGOs and the responsibility of transnational corporations for human rights violations? How can accountability mechanisms be ensured? The question of universal social and economic rights. How can the rights of children, migrants, and refugees be upheld? corporate responsibility, and the question of tax shelters. And I really think this issue of responsibility is an essential issue uh, and a question we must all ask. You know, what is the responsibility of the public sector, of global governance, of civil society? Uh, I think we're all aware of these responsibilities, but then how does one implement it? How does one get that cooperation really to work? Uh, so often we see at the global governance level the failures uh, because the left hand doesn't coordinate with the right hand. Uh, so that's uh, one of the, uh, the aspects. We hope to gain some, uh, some, some insights on during this panel. I'd like to introduce as the first speaker, uh, Rosa Pavanelli. 
who is the General Secretary of the Global Union Federation Public Services International. She's a member of the United Nations High Level Experts and Leaders Panel on Water and Disasters. And in March 2016, she was nominated as Commissioner for the United Nations Secretary General's High Level Commission on Health, Employment, and Economic Growth. The topic she'll be speaking on is international trade agreements and democratic rights. Please give a warm welcome to Ms. Rosa Pavanelli. Thank you very much uh, for inviting public services to this very exciting and important uh, uh, conference. It's uh, not common, I would say it seldom happens that uh, uh, academics and uh, uh, institutions uh, outside the labor movement invite uh, trade unions uh, to their meetings. And I think uh, this is uh, for me an honor, but it's above all a huge opportunity to show how the point of view of workers and of the labor movement is important in order to achieve the recognition of human rights and how for public services, workers, and trade unions is even more important. Uh, to be brief, I would like to say that we used to call public service workers the producers of human rights because there will be no universal access, no universal recognition of the right to health, the right to education, the right to water and sanitation without a public provision and the public governance of uh, the, those services. I would like to start my speech highlighting the fact that, that we are now facing, uh, uh, I would say, a schizophrenic debate at global level if not to say hypocritical uh, debate. Because it seems that everybody is recognizing an increasing number of rights to everybody, to anything, uh, to whatever can be entitled of right around the world. Luckily, we are now facing a huge debate where the right of nature, of animals, of the environment, start becoming something binding for our governments and our community to be respected. At the same time, we are facing a global debate where the right of corporates uh, is brought at global level as uh, something uh, competing with uh, human rights. And there's a broad debate about the fact that informatic technology, robots, can be entitled of rights. That's a common debate in the World Economic Forum. To see and to discuss how these can compete with human labor, for instance. Moreover, I think that the current debate is uh, uh, representing a shift from human rights to economic rights. Is hugely present in the global discussion the fact that, that more and more, or less and less, we debate about citizen or user rights. While we discuss a lot, and there's a broad recognition of consumer right. That means that we are shifting the focus from universal recognized human rights to the need can be, that can be satisfied from the market to, to consumers. And at the same time, I have to, re, to say that unfortunately, there's a strong uh, uh, that's it, there's a cultural environment that is putting in conflict individual and collective right. While, uh, and to give you, you know, the example, I think that after the Second World War, this is the period where uh, we are facing, as labor movement, the hugest attack on workers' rights, on their right to collectively organize, to collectively bargaining, to protect and enhance their uh, working conditions collectively, not as 
individual, but at the same time, misrecognizing uh, the, uh, the need to have collective rights is something that is uh, mm, uh, weaknessing um, our, uh, our communities as well. Uh, there is a global attempt uh, to define with a legal frame uh, this uh, uh, global debate and to ensure the right of corporates to make a profit at the expenses of all uh, the rest of the society and the community. I want to be clear, I'm not against business, I'm not against trade, I'm not against enterprises no matter their size. I am against the fact that less and less government have the authority to regulate and to take a decision when the interests of corporates are at stake. Uh, there is the new generation of trade agreements, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the CETA, the Canadian and European Trade Union uh, Agreement, the uh, TTIP, the uh, trans, uh, um, transatlantic Treaty on Investment between EU and the US. And finally, the uh, Trading Services Agreement that are under negotiation, or some are already in the process to be ratified, um, mm, that have been negotiated or are under negotiation in secret, where uh, the attempt of corporates to make the rules is something very strong. And is something that we should, if we care about human rights, be aware, at least altogether. Um, why I say this? Because in those agreements, and for the parts that now we know, the CETA, the TPP, but also the leaks around, uh, uh, around uh, uh, the TISA negotiations, uh, workers are treated as a commodity to be traded, to be dealt with uh, as any other uh, uh, goods you can, uh, commodity you can, uh, you can exchange. Mm, there's, uh, in TPP we knew after we could see the final text uh, that uh, the ILO convention, all the ILO convention protecting workers are considered the ceiling and not the floor of uh, national laws or regulation. That means that according to the content of, these, uh, of those trade agreements, uh, any better regulation uh, or more favorable regulation in, for workers could be considered a barrier to the freedom of trade for corporates that want to bring at a lower uh, wage or lower working condition workers around the world. Or what to say about the fact that what was mowed for in uh, the GATS under the WTO is being enhanced and pushed uh, even more dramatically through this definition of the movement of physical persons that are considered as a tool uh, uh, for the production of services uh, uh, instead of being considered migrants as they should be. Uh, protected by UN Convention and ILO Conventions on, uh, on Migration. But there is also another part of the threat uh, uh, that I think it's even more important than the protection of workers. And is the fact that these trades are challenging the recognition of human and civil rights of people. Why I say this? Well, first of all, because they are trying to prepare binding clause that will be binding, uh, right, for all countries signing the trade agreement or those countries that will in future join those trade agreements. Uh, I give you just a, an example. Uh, it was the, the opening ceremony of COP21 in Paris, 
when the discussion on climate change and the agreement of climate change uh, was uh, starting, that uh, I'm proud to say PSI was able to release a, a first analysis on the WikiLeaks uh, on uh, the chapter on climate change and the environment of the TISA negotiation. Yeah. And I read, uh, because I don't want uh, to make mistakes, this uh, uh, text says uh, that the negotiators of TISA are discussing binding clauses uh, denying regulators the right to distinguish solar from nuclear, wind from coal, or geothermal from fracking by establishing the principle of technological neutrality. This means that whatever standards we want to fix at global level, if these trade agreements fix these clauses, no country will be able to regulate against those treaties. And this is why I think civil rights for everybody are at stake as well, because democracy is at stake. The right to government to regulate is at stake if this will not be Mm, will not be respected. I just, just another brief example on, uh, on, um, on this. Uh, there is the health chapter. It has been discussed for many years, I would say, under the TPP, under the TTIP treaty, and under the TISA treaty. And corporates and insurance uh, were trying to push very much uh, the idea that the health market should be open everywhere around the world for having services moving. But of course, there's a responsibility of states. States are accountable for public health. States are, governments are accountable for the uh, health of their patient. And I would say with a kind of cynicism that Luckily, Ebola put us in front of the threat of a pandemic uh, that can spread all over the world without a strong public governance and strong regulation. So what is now under discussion in those treaties is the fact that, okay, we have several fulfillment that we need uh, to, to, to respect uh, if we want to move services around the country. So better to decide that whenever a person needs a care, we move this person where the w labor force is cheaper rather than giving them cares in their own countries. The commodification of patients instead of the commodification of services in the health sector. That is a challenge, that is a threat to the human rights to health uh, to which any human being is entitled. And finally, trying to be, uh, to be very brief, I would like to highlight the fact that there are uh, two other issues that are threatening our democracies related uh, to this economic global trend. The first is the fact of that uh, we discussed before about International Court of Justice. Um, these treats, uh, and it's also a system already recognized under the WHO, uh, the investment state dispute settlement is a challenge to national regulation and national uh, judiciary systems. And even the lighter, the softer form of the ICS, the International Card um, System, uh, will not solve the problem to recognize the right to regulate on their, uh, for, their, uh, for the benefit of their community and of their citizens. Second, uh, I think that uh, there's a huge debate about uh, the social responsibility of corporates. Uh, there's uh, a UN frame, the global compact, where this idea is uh, presented as the solution also to boost the economy around the world, but at the same time reducing inequality. Uh, unfortunately, I think that if we want to be serious, we need to say at global level that uh, responding to the tax obligation for corporates should be the first 
and four most important social responsibility because they have to repay in the country where they produce their profit, where they get their profit, the community that is contributing with raw material, with workforce uh, to, this, uh, uh, to their, uh, to their uh, uh, enrichment. Um, I think that uh, there's a frame that is moving. OECD BEPS program is part of this frame, but it's now still addressing only the OECD countries. We need to have everybody on board, developing or de and developed country as well, to make a fairer and more just society if we want uh, to avoid the perpetuation of an unfair colonial system, and if we want uh, to be sure that uh, we are trying to build a better world for all with less conflict, uh, reducing the causes for conflicts, and uh, uh, enhancing uh, more justice and equality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Pavanelli. Uh, I think we all know why Ogbondor extended the invitation to her in an excellent way of really beginning uh, this panel, and I think really having launched uh, so many of the, the pressing issues. So we're very grateful to that uh, initial presentation.